Thank you and welcome to FD50, Basic Apparel Construction. Today we're going to begin our sewing lesson with constructing some very basic and uh, heavily utilized seams. But before I begin sewing today, I'm going to take a look at the sewing machine and double check that it's threaded correctly and that the bobbin tension is also correct. So I'm going to make a quick visual check looking at the thread path on the upper part of the machine. I'm going to pull out the bobbin thread and check to make sure that it's coming off of the bobbin in the correct direction. It's not, so I need to change it. Remember, when the thread is coming off of the bobbin, you want the bobbin to turn in a clockwise direction. Once I've checked that, I'm then going to check the bobbin tension by seeing if I can get the bobbin to slide down the string by shaking it. This is a little bit loose, so I'm going to need to tighten it. So I'm going to use the large screw on the side of the bobbin case and I'm going to turn it to the right just a little bit. Double check it again, that's better. And then I'm going to insert it. Going to use the needle thread to pull up the bobbin thread by turning the flywheel toward me. Pull on my needle thread and the bobbin thread is going to pop right up through the toes of the presser foot. So now we're ready to sew. The first seam that we're going to be doing is a plain seam. And this is what the plain seam looks like on the outside of the garment. On the inside, it just looks flat. I'm changing the thread color between the needle thread and the bobbin thread so you'll be able to tell as I'm sewing along what is the needle thread and which is the bobbin thread. I have the machine threaded today so that the pink thread is the bobbin thread and navy blue is going to be the needle thread. To begin our plain seam, we're going to take two pieces of fabric and we're going to put them right sides together. This lightweight denim is dark blue on the right side or the face side of the fabric and it's a lighter color blue on the wrong side or back side of the fabric. I'm going to line up the raw edges of my fabric, get rid of any long thread tails that are in the way because we want things to stay nice and neat. I'm going to mark my seam allowance. And most of the sewing that we do in FD50 is done with a half an inch seam allowance. So I'm going to make a clip in the top edge of the fabric a half an inch away from the raw edge. And I'm cutting through all four layers of fabric just because it's quicker. So I have notches at the top and at the bottom of the fabric. They're at one half of an inch from the raw edge, so we're going to use these notches to give us guidelines on sewing our seam. We also have a calibrated throat plate located here on the bed of the machine with one quarter, one half, three quarter, one inch, and one and one quarter inch seam allowance lines. And We can use this calibrated throat plate to help us identify our seam allowance. So I'm going to line up the edge of my fabric with the half inch mark. You can see it right here. I'm going to begin my plain seam with a back tack. That is, I'm going to start sewing forward a couple of stitches and then I'm going to back the machine up and then I'm going to stitch forward. Sometimes the machine wants to take off with you. So to sew the plain seam, I am merely going to press down on the foot pedal and sew with the edge of my fabric at one half of an inch. When I reach the end of my seam line, I'm going to end with a back tack by backing up a couple of stitches and then stitching forward. To remove the fabric from the machine, I'm going to raise the needle to the highest position and you can check that by looking at the where the take-up lever is located. You want it to be all the way to the top and then starting just 
back down. Once the needle and the take-up lever are in the appropriate position, raise the presser foot using the knee lifter and pull the fabric out of the machine toward the back of the machine or away from you. Clip your threads close to the end of your work and make sure that you leave a nice tail coming out the back. That way when you start sewing on the next seam you won't be as likely to unthread the needle and that's always a nuisance. Clip the thread at the beginning of your work and there you have a plain seam. To complete the seam we're going to press it. First step in pressing is going to be to meld the stitches. And we're going to do that by using the steam iron and a little bit of steam and press the fabric just as it was in the sewing machine. That kind of forces a crimp into the thread so that the, it acts more like a knot and it's less likely to come unraveled. The next step is going to be to press to one side and then to the other side. So we're going to kind of break the fibers in the fabric along the seam line. The final step is going to be, in this case, to open the seam and press the seam allowances out flat. Give it a quick touch from the top and you're done. And that's a plain seam that's been completed. It's nice and tidy on the front and nice and tidy on the back side. Most of our garments are done with a plain seam like this. <clears throat> the next seam that we're going to do is a self-finished seam. It's a superimposed seam just like our plain seam was. Now a superimposed seam merely means that when we begin stitching that our two layers of fabric are together and the edges match where we're going to sew. In this case, the French seam, we start with our wrong sides together because it is an enclosed seam. If you take a look at this, you can see the completed French seam in this area between my fingers. The lower part of this is the first half of the seam and we're going to begin the French seam with the wrong sides together. So if these are the right sides of our fabric, we want to begin sewing with the wrong sides together. Now, since a French seam is an enclosed seam, we need to calculate how much of our seam is going to be taken up with the first step and then add that to the amount of fabric that's being taken up by the second step. So if I want this seam to be a French seam and I want a fairly narrow one, I want the first step to finish at an eighth of an inch and the second step to finish it just larger than a quarter of an inch so that it will enclose the first. So I'm going to add one eighth and one quarter which will give me three eighths of an inch. So my seam allowance for this seam is going to be three eighths of an inch. So I'm going to mark my seam allowances just as I did before. This time however I'm only going to clip at 3 eighths of an inch. And that's going to be where my second seam line occurs. The first one is going to occur 
at an eighth of an inch. Now we don't have a calibration on the sewing machine for an eighth of an inch, so you're going to have to judge it and try and put the raw edge of the fabric here between the needle and the one quarter inch calibrated mark. You're going to begin and end with a back tack, but be sure and hold the threads when you begin. So as I'm sewing this, I'm actually running the edge of my fabric right down the center of the right toe. When I get to the end, I'm going to end again with a back tack. Raise the needle and the take up lever to remove the fabric from the machine. Now, it's important that you trim all of these little beards because you don't want them poking out and showing on the right side of the garment. So I'm going to carefully trim even closer than my eighth of an inch. careful not to clip your thread ends where you started because you want to use those to hang on to. They're going to help you control the fabric for the next step. You can see why French seams are expensive or occur in expensive garments. They take a lot of extra labor. Okay. Before we sew the second half of our seam, we're going to do some pressing. The first step, of course, is to meld the stitches. Then we're going to open this up, press to one side, then press again to the opposite side. Now we fold the right sides together. And you can use your thread tails to help you position that first seam right along the edge because we want to have it right along the edge. Double check. That looks pretty good. So now I'm ready for the second step. When you're sewing a complex seam like a French seam, you want to make sure that you always start sewing at the same end of the stitching. And that's another reason to have this long tail here to help remind you which end was up. Now I'm going to put the machine, the fabric into the machine and I'm centering my needle right over the notch. And you'll see that the edge, my folded edge of my fabric is right at a quarter of an inch. I'm going to begin again with a back tack. And I'm going to grab on to all four of my threads with my left hand so that I can hold the fabric taut. When I get to the end, my back tacking is sewing off. Raise the needle, pull the work out to the back of the machine, and now I'm ready to do the final pressing on my French seam.
going to begin by melding the stitches. And I'm going to open this so that I can press it to one side and then to the other. And you'll notice that I'm putting a little bit of tension on the fabric so that I am sure to open the seam completely. Turn it over, lay it out nice and flat. And there you have your completed French seam. There are no little whiskers showing on the outside of the garment. And the inside, there are no ravelings. So this is a self-finished seam because the seam is finished as you construct it. That's different from what we're going to be doing after another couple of stitches. I have a couple of more self-finished seams, seams to show you. The next seam that we're going to be doing is a lapped seam. And it's characterized by two rows of stitching on the outer side of the garment, as well as two rows of stitching on the underneath side of the garment. The seam allowance is what's measured between the two rows of stitching. To begin the lap seam, we're going to need to start with a different kind of notch. Well, not a different kind of notch, but we're going to put the notch in a different place. I'm going to start with a notch at one inch from the edge of the fabric. Now I'm eyeballing one inch, but if you need to, you can use a seam gauge to measure precisely. Now I'm going to begin by pressing a quarter inch over like that on both pieces. Although on one piece I'm going to press a quarter of an inch to the wrong side of the fabric and on the other side of the seam we're going to press a quarter of an inch to the right side of the fabric. Now you want to be sure that you get a good press on this. So you can even help it along with your fingers to help drive the steam and the crease into the piece of fabric. Folding over a quarter of an inch. Now when I put these two together, I'm going to line up the folded edge of my fabric with the notch. So, folded edge of the fabric with a notch and I'm going to pin. I'm going to move to the opposite end and I'm going to match up the folded edge of the fabric with the notch at this end. Now that's a lot of space there in the middle that can kind of move around on you. So if you put a little bit of tension on the fabric like this and then let it relax, 
the fabric will naturally want to move pretty close to being straight on grain. And you can put another pin in to hold it. Now, if you've noticed, I've run my pins perpendicular to what my seam line is going to be, and I've put my pin heads on the right side. That's so that it'll be easier for me to take the pins out of the machine. Take the thread tails and begin with a back tack. And when I've put the machine in, or the fabric into the machine, I'm lining up the folded edge of my fabric with the inside edge of the left toe of the sewing machine, right here. That's going to put my needle over about a 32nd of an inch from the fold, which is exactly where I want it to be. Beginning with the back tack. And I kind of smooth the fabric in front of the needle to help it relax and fall on the straight of the grain. As I get to my second pin, I'm going to pull it out. Try not to sew over any pins. That's bad news for your needle, and it's bad news for the sewing machine. It's kind of like you driving a car at 60 miles an hour and running into a brick wall. get close to the last pin, pull it out, and end with a back tack. Raise the needle, pull your work out. Now whenever I pull the work out of the machine, you'll notice that I'm cutting it close to the end of my stitching. That way I always know where I started. Now. I'm going to flip the work over so that I'm looking at the wrong side. And here's my second crease. And you'll notice that my folded edge is lining up with my notch. Put the fabric into the machine. Grab your thread tails to support your work and begin with a back tack. Again, I am lining up the folded edge of my fabric with the inside edge of the left toe. I'm using the thread tails to support the fabric so that I can keep it taut. Smooth the folded edge of the fabric underneath so it lies nice and flat. Grab your work at the end that's towards you and when you can grab it behind the needle and put a little bit of tension onto the fabric. Keep it taut. And you can sew right down the edge of this. End with a back tack. Okay, we've finished our lapped seam. All that remains is to give it a press. Now if you notice some bubbling and puckering in here, that's because the sewing machine has done some stretching on the fabric. And most of that will press out. So, there's our completed lap seam. All that remains is to clip off the thread tails close to the work. Now, I've mentioned a couple of times that you need to hang on to your fabric and your thread tails and taut sew. Let me demonstrate to you why we need to do that. I'm going to take two pieces of fabric and I want you to watch this carefully. I'm going to sew a plain seam, but I want these two pieces of fabric to be exactly the same length. So I'm going to trim them 
because this is a little bit of magic. And you can use it to your advantage. So I'm trimming both of these layers of fabric. So that you can see that they're absolutely equal. Now, I'm going to put this into the sewing machine and I'm just going to let the machine do what it wants to do. I'm not going to taut sew. Now, if you look carefully here, right in front of the toes of the presser feet, you'll see a bubble begin to develop. You see that? And do you see how the fabric is wanting to pull away? The top layer is wanting to move away from the bottom layer. Okay, here you have it. Look, even though I started with two pieces of fabric that were precisely the same length, I ended up with almost 3 eighths of an inch difference in length by the time I finished sewing this 11 inch piece of fabric. That's caused by the presser foot wanting to push the fabric and the feed dogs pulling it. So you get a movement like this. The top layer will stretch and the bottom layer will draw up. It's an important thing for you to remember. You compensate for this by taut sewing, by hanging on to the thread behind the needle and hanging on to the fabric in front of the needle and keeping tension equalized between the two layers of fabric. That way you're kind of bullying the machine into doing what you want it to do. The next seam that we're going to do is a flat felled seam and there are several different ways to construct this. Some of them require special machines that fold the fabric and sew it with two needles at the same time. But since we're using a single needle lock stitch machine, we have to do this in a two-step process. So our flat felled seam is going to be characterized by one layer of top stitching on the outside of the garment while on the inside you're going to see two parallel rows of stitching. And to do this we're going to start with our fabric right sides together but they are going to be offset one quarter of an inch. <clears throat> so I'm going to put this into the sewing machine so that my two layers of fabric are offset by a quarter of an inch and I'm going to put the upper layer of fabric the raw edge right next to the outside of the right toe of the presser foot, which is also my quarter inch seam line. I'm going to begin with the back tack. And I'm going to use my taut sewing technique to keep the two layers of fabric together. If you need to, you can put pins in. Pin perpendicular to your work with your heads accessible so you can pull them out easily as you approach them. I'm using my thread tails to help me with my taut sewing until I have enough fabric to grab. Set up my taut sewing again. And stitching to the end, ending with the back tack. 
trim your threads close to your work. And now we need to do some pressing. First thing we're going to do is meld our stitches. We're going to take the wider edge of our seam allowance and fold it over the narrow edge. And I'm going to put just the bare ends of the threads right along the seam line. Be careful, don't overlap the seam line, but just shy of the seam line. You want to make sure that you've got an allowance that's going to be caught, but by the same token we don't want to put a lot of additional bulk in there by having those beards fold back on themselves. So if you look carefully, you can see my seam line. Okay, now that you've got this first step pressed, then we're going to fold the fabric the rest of the way over so that those beards are caught inside. The neater your pressing job, the neater your sewing job. So, you want to double check and make sure that you've got it well pressed on the top. You don't want any pleats along the seam line. We're going to put it back into the sewing machine and we're going to sew. And I'm going to line up the folded edge of my fabric with the inside edge of the left toe of my presser foot. Grab all of your thread tails and hang on to them. And begin with a back tack. Make sure that your fabric is nice and smooth. And just keep that folded edge of the fabric lined right up with the inside toe of the presser foot. And when you reach the end, give yourself a back tack. Trim your threads. Oops, I missed one. thread tails and there you have a finished flat felled seam. Flat felled seam is a very durable seam because it's sewn twice. There's no wonder that Levi Strauss didn't employ this particular seaming method on his jeans. We've been wearing those jeans since the 1850s so it's not likely to wear out or split. Okay, we finished talking about enclosed seams and self-finished seams. The enclosed seam was the French seam. The self-finished seams were the French seam, the lap seam, and the flat felled seam. Now we're going to move on to seam finishes, which are a separate operation. They're done after the seam is completed. The first seam finish is going to be paint. That is, I'm going to use a pair of scissors 
called pinking shears to create this zigzag edge, which helps control the amount of fraying and thus how much seam allowance you're going to lose through the normal wear and tear on a garment. To do the pinked seam, we're going to sew a plain seam. But since we're trimming some of our seam allowance away, when we finished our operation, we want to begin with a little bit larger seam allowance. So instead of our normal half inch, I'm going to begin with three quarters of an inch. So I've marked my three quarters of an inch seam allowance at each end. Put it into the machine. Begin and end with the back tack. And I'm following the three quarter inch line. When you get to the end, back tack. So our first step was to sew the plain seam. The second step is to use the pinking shears. And this is a pair of pinking shears. You notice that we have some tooths that cut that characteristic edge. Now, you're going to need to cut this one layer at a time. And I want for you to know that there's no one single pair of pinking shears that are going to cut every piece of fabric that you own. So it's a good idea to have access to a couple of different brands. I checked these Fiskars on the denim before I came to the filming to make sure that it would cut, but it's not unusual that you'll find that the pinking shears are just going to want to mangle the edge of the fabric. Make sure that you're holding the fabric that you don't want to have cut away from the blades of the shears. Try and keep your clips neat so that you're cutting off an even amount and that you've got a nice, pretty, and even seam allowance. Clean up your nasty little threadlets. and trim the opposite side. Now, one of the marks of a well-sewn garment is, is that your seam allowances are straight and even one side to the other. Life's also a whole lot easier if you trim your thread tails and get them thrown away as you complete each step. That way they aren't hanging around on your garment or lying around on the sewing machine to make a mess later on. To press our seam, we follow the same steps that we've done before. Meld the stitches. Press one side to the other, keeping some tension on the fabric. Use your fingers to open and press. Okay. And there we have our plain seam with a pinked finished. You want to make sure that your seam allowances are nice and even because you want the inside of your garment to look as nice as the outside. People do notice the inside of their garment when they put it on, probably not after they look at it when they've tried it on in a dressing room at the store. But people do notice this kind of attention to detail. So it's worth the time and the effort to do a good job all the way through.
our next seam finish is turned and stitched. Again, we begin with a plain seam on the outside. We don't see any raw edges along the edge of our seam allowance because they have been pressed under and stitched down. This is a labor intensive seam because it takes three passes on each seam to do this. It's used commonly on high-end unlined garments um, where you see the inside of the garment. And there are a couple of well-known designers. Dana Buckman is one who has used this seam finish extensively. So we'll move on and demonstrate that. We begin with the right sides of our fabric together. And like the pink seam, we're going to be using some of the seam allowance to do the turn and stitch finish. So I'm going to begin with a wider seam allowance. I'm going to give myself about an inch this time. So I've marked my notches top and bottom. Put the work in the machine and begin with the back tack. Use my thread tails to help establish my taut sewing. Now when I do my taut sewing, taut sewing, I am not really trying to stretch my fabric and I am not trying to impede its flow through the machine. I am just trying to keep tension on the two layers so that they stay tracking together as they go through the machine and end with the back tack. Take your work out. Now. You can do this turned and, turned and stitched finish two ways. The quick way is to hold your fabric so that your garment is out of the way and you're only dealing with one layer of fabric. And you can fold it over a quarter of an inch. And I allowed for that. I lost my bobbin thread. Got to find it. the bobbin thread back up. So fold the seam allowance over to the wrong side a quarter of an inch and then put your work under the presser foot and then as you sew continue folding and just work between the toe of the presser foot and a comfortable distance where you can hold that quarter of an inch fold in. Take the work out and trim. So here we have one half of the turned and stitched finish. And you can see that the edge of the fabric has gotten distorted slightly because it's been stretched going through the machine. We'll take care of that with our pressing. If you're uncomfortable doing what I just did, that is folding a quarter of an inch and then holding it five or six inches away and stitching it, then you might want to go to the iron and press your quarter inch of allowance over first. That's certainly okay.
But as I do that, remember I want my garment out of the way and I'm just dealing with one layer of my seam allowance. I'm going to fold it, hold it between my index finger and my middle finger. And you need to be careful doing this because you don't want to burn your fingers. Irons are hot. So if you just do a little press between your two fingers, that's going to help you establish the fold line. Then, once you've got it established, then you can move your iron ahead and finish the pressing. Now, you always want to start sewing in the, in the same direction, so here I am, I'm picking up my thread tails again so that I know where I started. It's not necessary to begin and end with the back tack on this seam finish because there's not going to be any stress on it. We back tack at the beginning and the end of seams because they will have stress and sometimes they're trimmed off. Now we're ready to do the final pressing. We want to begin by melding the stitches on each side. Then press our seam to one side and to the other side. And then lastly, We open it and give a quick press on the top. Okay, there's our finished, turned, and stitched seam finish. Now through all of this pressing, you may have noticed me handling the iron differently than if you were ironing a shirt. And there is a difference. When you're ironing, you've got the full weight of the iron down on the fabric and you're pushing the fabric. And you see how it moves, okay? When I'm sewing, I'm not really ironing. I'm pressing. So rarely am I putting the full weight of the iron down. It may look like it, but I tend to move it, pick up the iron, set it down, pick up the iron, set it down. I'm not going this way. I also try and follow the grain line of the fabric. So I press in the lengthwise direction or in the crosswise direction. I avoid going on a diagonal as much as I possibly can because I don't want to distort and stretch the fabric. The last seam finish that I wanted to show you, although I'm not going to demonstrate it today, is the surged or overcast edge. I began by constructing my plain seam. After I constructed it, I did my pressing. And then I went to the three thread overlock machine, inserted my fabric so that my garment was lying off to the left side and I could put one side of my seam allowance underneath the presser foot of the overlock machine. I lined up the left edge of the presser foot with my seam line and sewed the length of the seam. When I got to the end, I trimmed it. I took it, my work out of the machine, turned it around, again made sure that my garment was off to the left, put the seam allowance underneath the presser foot, lined the presser foot up with the left edge of my seam line, 
and then I just sewed the length of my seam. So we've had our plain seam with a pinked finish, a turned and stitched finish, and an overcast finish. Now, you noticed on each of those that the seam allowance was pressed open so that it looked like this on the inside of the garment. And this is called an open seam or a butterflied or busted seam. That's different than a closed seam, which is a seam that is pressed to one side. If we go back to the first plain seam that I demonstrated, you'll see that my seam allowances are not open, but they're pressed to one side. So this is called a closed seam. Now, I could finish this seam closed with the over edge, or I could pink it, or I could do either one of the two finishes that I'm going to show you next. The two that I'm going to show you next can be done open or closed. And they're very, very similar to each other. On the surface of the garment, on the inside, they look exactly the same. On this side we have the bias bound, and it looks like this on the underneath side. On the other half of the seam we have the Hong Kong finish, and it looks very similar to the bias bound, but it is different. And perhaps the easiest way to see that is, is that if we look at this end of the bias bound seam, where I've opened it, you can see that our piece of bias that finishes it is lying out flat. Whereas on the bias bound seam, we have a slightly wider piece of bias that has been folded. Doing these two is a very simple process. It may look complicated. It begins by having bias ready to go. Now, bias is anything other than the straight of the grain. When you're looking at fabric, we have this edge here, which if you look is very neat and tidy, and it's called the selvage edge of the fabric. The selvage edge parallels the lengthwise grain of the fabric, and it has a finished edge generally. The lengthwise grain and the selvage are formed with the warp threads on the loom. The crosswise grain here, which has this torn edge, is the weft or is formed with the, the yarn that goes over and under and over and under the warp threads. When the fabric is woven, these two threads, the weft and the warp, are at 90 degrees or right angles to each other. Bias is anything that is not lengthwise or crosswise. So this diagonal line is bias, as is this diagonal line. However, when we're going to be doing the seam finishes for Hong Kong or bias bound, we want the true bias, which is precisely at 45 degrees. So to get that, we're going to fold our fabric so that the lengthwise grain is matching the crosswise grain. This folded edge is at 45 degrees and that is the true bias. So I'm going to cut a couple of bias strips. And to do that I'm going to use my seam gauge. And because I want to have these strips finish at an inch and a quarter and I'm working on my fold, I'm going to put my inch and a quarter mark right on the fold and I'm going to draw a little mark. And I'm just going to fall down my folded edge marking an inch and a quarter. Then I'm going to use my seam gauge and I'm going to connect the dots and draw a line lightly so that I can follow it with my scissors. <coughs> 
So, now I'm going to cut right on my pencil line. So now I have a bias strip that's two and a half inches wide. So I want to cut it in half. I'm going to follow my fold line. So now I have two one and a quarter inches of fabric cut on the true bias. Now, one of the characteristics of bias is, is that it stretches. And that can work for us or it can work against us. So I want to take the stretch out of this so that I have more control because I want to be in control. I don't want the fabric in control. So I'm going to press the stretch. Actually, this time I'm going to iron the stretch right out of this by pulling it out. And as that happens, you can see that my bias got narrow and a little bit longer. You can expect that to happen. And that, in this case, is a good thing. When you're determining the width of your bias strips, you need to allow for the fact that your fabric is going to get a little bit skinnier and a little bit longer. One of the benefits and one of the reasons we use bias is, is that it will shape nicer than a straight piece of fabric will and it will turn easier over our seam lines. So. I'm going to sew our proverbial plain seam and this can go on almost any seam allowance width that you want. Um, it would be a little bit difficult to put on a quarter of an inch seam so I'm going to sew at our normal seam which is a half an inch. and I'm going to make it easier on myself and I'm going to press my plain seam. If I press my seam it helps me make sure that I've got my garment off to the side and that everything can lie a little bit flatter underneath the presser foot. Okay, now the first one that I'm going to do is the bias um, bound seam. And I'm going to begin by shifting my garment to one side so that I've got one layer of my seam allowance. And I'm looking at the inside of my garment here. I'm going to lie my bias right along the raw edge of my seam allowance. And I'm going to sew at just under a quarter of an inch. Now because I stretched my bias I've taken a lot of the wiggly out of it which is something that I want to do. So my raw edge of my fabric and my bias strip are lying right along the outside edge of the right toe of my presser foot. 
work out of the machine and since I've got way too much bias I'm going to trim it off. So I've got the first half of my bias bound seam ready to go. The second half is I'm turning it over so that I'm looking at the opposite side of my garment and my bias bound is going to fold over the edge of my bias to meet the raw edge of my fabric and then I'm going to fold it again so that my bias covers the original line of stitching. Show it to you again. Fold the edge of the bias over so that it just meets the raw edge of the fabric and then fold it again and because it's awkward I'm going to pin it and I'm pinning right in the dwell of the seam between my bias and my twill so that on the other side you can see where my pin is sitting and I'm just going to fold and pin the length of my seam. This time when I'm pinning in the dwell of the seam like this, it will give me a neater line of stitching and a neater edge along here if I'm pinning where I'm going to be stitching and pulling the pin out toward me, as opposed to pinning it crosswise like this, which will tend to give me a little bit of a point on the outside. Now, you've noticed that every seam that I have sewn, I've always left long tails at the beginning of my sewing. That's so I'm always keeping track of where I started sewing. Because when you're sewing successive lines of stitching on the same piece of fabric, if you switch ends or switch directions, you're going to get twisting in your fabric. And that would be particularly apparent on this bias piece. So to control that, I'm always sewing and beginning my sewing at the same end of my garment. I'm putting this into the machine carefully because I want my needle here to come down right next to the fold of my bias so that my stitching will disappear in the shadow or the dwell of my original seam line that sewed my bias on. Hang on to my tails. And as I get to successive pins, I pull them out. When I get enough fabric behind the needle, then I can use the fabric to hold. And I'm just trying to shoot down the edge of my bias and between my stitching I'm running my finger down where I'm going to be sewing and when I'm doing that not only am I smoothing and making it a nice thing to sew but my fingers are telling me whether or not I've got even distances underneath where I can't see. So I'm touching to see where the folds of my fabric are beneath. That way I'm sure that I've got fabric to stitch on for my bias on the bottom and that I'm sure that my bias has not come unfolded. Here we go. I've caught 
the length of my bias, the whole length of the seam, and I don't have any bias coming unfolded. It's not as perfect as I might like, but this is certainly acceptable because when the garment is on, it certainly looks nice from the top side. You can see here where I kind of missed a little bit and it's perfectly apparent. But if I were sewing with matching threads and matching bias, that wouldn't be real obvious. Okay, now the next one that I'm going to demonstrate is the Hong Kong finish. So I'm going to apply the Hong Kong finish to this side of the seam allowance. I fold my garment out of the way. I'm going to lay my bias piece down right on top of my seam allowance. I'm going to match the raw edges. So far we're beginning exactly the same way that we did for the bias bound. You want to check and make sure that your garment's out of the way, your seam allowances that you've already finished is out of the way, and that things are lying nice and flat. It's kind of like petting your puppy. Now, the difference between the bias bound and the Hong Kong seam occurs right now. That is, I am merely going to wrap the bias around my seam allowance, but I am not going to put in that second fold. So my bias strip is going to lie flat. And since it's lying flat, I don't need to pin it. Again, I'm putting it into the machine where I started so that I am sewing in the same direction that I did the first time to avoid putting twist in my bias. I can use my fingers to make sure that my bias is lying snug against the raw edge of my seam allowance. and that my seam allowance is lying nice and flat. Now, I've got way too much bias left over, and if I were to leave that, it would get wadded up and wrinkled underneath the seam line and um, would look awful on the outside of my garment. So now that it's sewn, I can trim away the excess. And you want to trim kind of close. The really neat thing about bias is it doesn't ravel, and that's why we use it in a lot of cases. Unlike this twill that I'm sewing with, which ravels all over the place, this bias is going to stay nice and neat and not have any little thread tails hanging out. Okay, So now my two seams are finished. I've got bias bound on one side, which is characterized by the bias edge being folded under and the Hong Kong finish, which is characterized by the single fold and a raw edge adjacent to your stitching line. So now all I have to do is press my finish.
bias bound and Hong Kong seam finishes. These are used on very high-end garments because they're even more labor intensive than the turned and stitched finished. But they give you a beautiful finish on the inside of a garment that is not going to have the seams covered by a lining. Typically we use self fabric for the bias. We can also use a contrasting fabric which can make the inside of a garment kind of fun. If you've got a black jacket you may want to use a white bias or a red bias to kind of make the garment a little bit more fun and lively. You could even use a print. So the possibilities are endless. I want to show you next a couple of different types of eased seams. Ease is an interesting concept. It doesn't have anything to do with how simple or complicated something is. It has to do with, with the difference between two measurements. In this case, we're talking about the difference between two lengths of fabric. And on this first sample that I've got here for you, you can see that when we're matched at one end, the opposite side, I've got a piece of fabric that is a half an inch longer. And remember earlier when I was talking about the push and pull relationship between the presser foot and the feed dogs, I can use that to my advantage and ease the longer piece onto the shorter piece. This is a very handy technique. Um, you find it very frequently at the tops of sleeve caps on um, garments that are going on to waist bands where you need to have a little bit more fabric going around a tummy than you do around a waist. We use this um, on the backs of shoulders because we all have some curve on our shoulder blades so our back of our shoulder seams need to be a little bit longer than the front and that's exactly where we would use this application of an eased seam. Following the eased seam is going to be a sheared seam where we have to put a lot of extra fabric onto a short piece. We might use this on a full skirt going on to a waistband or on the front or the back of a shirt that we're joining to a yoke. But we'll begin first with the eased seam. And to begin that, I'm going to be start with two layers of fabric that are the same length. And then I'm going to trim one, one half of an inch shorter. Now, how much you can successfully ease without getting puckers or pleats is going to depend partly on your skill, but mostly on the fabrics that you're using. Okay, So here I've got one piece that's a half an inch shorter than the first piece. Now I want my ease to occur along the center of my seam line. So I'm going to put in what we call ease control notches. And that's basically going to tell me where I want to start easing the long piece on and where I need to have it all finished. So I've got a notch at one end and a notch at the other end and I'm going to pin my notches so that between my notches I've got all of that excess half inch. Okay. See it there? That's why that's grinning at you. And my two ends are even. Now to help this along, I'm going to run my pin through each side twice. That's going to help me, just give me a little bit more control. It's going to help maintain that extra fabric between my ease control notches. I'm going to start stitching at the end of my fabric. I'm going to sew the length and all of that puckering is going to occur between these two pins. 
I'm going to use my standard one half inch seam allowance and I'm going to begin and end my stitching with a back tack. So I'm going to carefully walk the machine by hand up to that first pin. From the edge of my fabric to that pin I had a one to one relationship. Now here's where we use the magic. I'm going to wrap the fabric around the heel of my right hand about halfway between my first notch and my second notch. I'm creating an inside outside curve so that the bottom layer of fabric has to travel further than the top layer. And I'm using my left hand between the two layers of fabric to help control the right left swing. I'm pressing down on the bottom layer of fabric with my thumb and I'm controlling the top layer of fabric with the top of my thumb and my index finger. And I'm going to do my taut sewing again. This time I'm making the machine work to pick up the fabric. So we're having a little bit of a disagreement here about who's going to win. I can use my thumb on the bottom layer to help push the bottom layer into the feed dogs. So that it will take it a little bit faster. But basically, it's having the fabric wrapped around the heel of my hand to create an inside-outside curve. The outside curve is that bottom layer. And as I get closer, I switch from the heel of my hand to my fingers. And again, the machine is having to fight me a little bit to get me to let go of the fabric. Once I get to my ease control notch, I can take that last pin out. I ended up with my two layers of fabric being virtually the same length. And you can see the puckering, which was the ease of the longer piece of fabric. Now, to press this, we don't want to press any pleats into those bubbles, but we do want to shrink them up a little bit. So I'm going to use the, e, the uh, steam and the heat of the iron to help me do that. So I'm going to steam it. I'm holding the iron above my work and I'm injecting steam with the steam switch and then I'm patting. And as I pat, mostly in my seam allowance, I'm shrinking it up. But I'm allowing the extra fullness that I worked hard to create to exist on the longer piece. And there you have an almost perfectly eased seam. Great to use across tummies on a waistband if the shorter piece were the waistband. Great to use across the back of the shoulder or the bottom of a yoke on the back of a shirt where we need to have a little bit extra length so that we can move in our garment and yet not have too much that's going to fall and flop into pleats and tucks. The extreme version of that is our sheared seam. And I'm going to start with a shorter piece. You can see the difference between these two and I'm going to put the longer piece onto the smaller piece. I'm going to begin by marking ease control notches because I want to be able to control where this fullness occurs. So I've got my ease control notches at the ends of my seams marked and I'm going to mark one in the middle. So I've got three notches on the short piece of fabric. I'm going to put three notches on the longer piece of fabric. Now if we were going to be using you know, a really long piece of fabric to ease on, I may want to have more than three notches. 
The key is, is that you use the same proportion, all right? Not the same distance, but the same proportion. So I'm going to mark the longer piece with the same ease control notches, that is roughly a half of an inch away from the end of my stitching, and then in the center. If I wanted more, I might fold center to my first notches and then notch again so that I would have a total then of two, four, five notches. But I'd have to put the same five notches on the short piece. So I would do that the same way. Folding my center notch to the two edge notches and then clipping here. Now, the next step is going to be doing my gathering stitches. And to do that, what I want to do is increase the stitch length. I'm going to turn the dial here up to 5. And I'm going to loosen the tension on my needle thread just slightly. So I've got a longer stitch and I've loosened my needle thread. I'm loosening the needle thread so that my bobbin thread, when I pull it to gather up the fabric, will slide easier and I'm less likely to break my thread. That's a real nuisance. So I'm going to do two rows of stitching. I'm going to do one at a quarter of an inch and I'm going to do one at three quarters of an inch. Now this time when I take my work out, I'm going to leave long tails at each end of my stitching so that I have something to pull. Now I'm going to do my second row of gathering stitches at three quarters of an inch. And again, when I take it out, I'm going to have long tails. Now, I'm going to turn it over, and I'm going to pull my bobbin thread. So I'm going to separate the needle thread from the bobbin thread. Now, when you're doing this, it helps to have two different colors of thread. However, you need to be careful what colors you choose. Thread sometimes has an excess of dye on it so that when you pull and gather up your stitches, the color from the thread could rub off onto your fabric. And when you remove these rows of gathering stitch, which we'll do later, it's going to leave behind a faint but visible color change. So you want to pick two colors that you can discern the difference between, but by the same time, you want them both close to your fabric. So that if they do rub off, another term for that is called crocking, if they do rub off, you're not going to be as likely to see it. Okay, so I'm now going to match my notches. I'm matching my center notch first and I'm running the pin through twice. Then I'm going to match my end notches, and I'm going to run my pin through twice. Now, when I run my pins through, I'm trying to have my pins cover my gathering stitches so that it helps my fabric lie nice and flat right along my notches. Sometimes you can use a pin to help you separate your threads. 
going to pull on my bobbin thread and that's going to cause my fabric to gather up and get short. And I'm going to pull until I've got an equal amount between my notches on both layers of fabric. Once I've done that, I'm going to kind of lock the threads between my fingers to hold them and then I can slide my gathers around and over the distance between my notches. And I want them to be kind of even looking in that I don't want any flat areas in the middle of my gathers. I want them to be evenly distributed. And the fabric will slide nice and easy because I remember I re reduced the tension on my needle threads. Once I have the gathers distributed the way that I want them, I'm going to put a pin in there to help hold them. And I want to make sure that the top edge of my fabric is matching the raw edge below. So my gathers are standing straight and tall at 90 degrees to what my sewing line is going to be. And the little woofalies along the edges are lying nice and even with the top edge of my shorter piece of fabric. Do the same thing on the other side. Now you notice in here how this wants to fold down. You don't want to have that fold down, so you're going to work to straighten it back up. Sometimes if you're doing even tighter gathers than what I'm doing here, that is gathering even a longer piece of fabric on, the top edge of the woofles wants to fall down and it can get caught in your stitching when you do your seam. And if that happens, you might see it on the outside of the garment. So you want to make sure that your pleats are standing straight and tall at 90 degrees to your line of sewing, that they're as evenly distributed over the distance as you want them to be, and that the raw edge is standing up and meeting the raw edge of the lower piece of fabric. I'm going to sew this at a half an inch seam allowance. As you can see here, my presser foot is falling right between the two rows of gathering stitches. Okay, Now, I set it up this way so that you could see where my presser foot was going to end up, but I'm actually going to want to take advantage of the feed dogs wanting to draw the fabric up, and I'm going to sew with the gathers down. But note where my presser foot is. It's right between the two rows of gathering stitches, and I did that by gathering at one quarter inch and three quarters of an inch. So now when I can't see where my gathering stitches are, I know where they are because I've got my work securely pinned and I was careful when I did my gathering stitches. Oops, I forgot. I need to turn this back down to a regular stitch length which is at about 12 stitches per inch. Get the pin out of the way. And I'm going to back tack. I'm going to use my taut sewing technique. So I'm going to use the thread tails to help me at the beginning here. And then when I get enough fabric behind the needle that I can grab it, I'm going to grab the fabric. When I come close to my pin, I'm going to stop and pull it out. I'm going to check along the right side here to make sure that my gathers are standing up the way that I want them. I can adjust the upper and under layer of fabric if something's gotten out of whack a little bit. 
I can even use my finger or a pen if my gathers have gotten spread apart or bunched up. So I'm going to check my work as I sew. If you stop and check your work as you sew, chances are you're going to end up with a better sewn product and you're not going to have to do as much ripping out because you're not going to be finding mistakes after you've sewn. Remember, as ye sew, so shall ye rip. Back tack at the end. Now you want to be careful at this point just to cut the thread that you sewed your seam with. Okay. Double check your work after you take it out before you start pulling any threads. Make sure that your gathers look nice, that they're standing straight and tall, you don't have any ends tucked underneath and caught in your stitching for your seam and check it from the right side. Do your gathers look like they're where you want them to be. It's going to be easier to deal with it now rather than later. If you're happy with the way your gathers are distributed and that the way that they're hanging, then you can go ahead and pull the line of gathering stitches out that falls below your seam allowance. Or another way to think of that is the line of stitching that you can see. And remember, you started pulling with your bobbin thread, so you want to finish your pulling with your bobbin thread. If you pull now with the needle thread, you're going to tie a knot, and it's going to be difficult to get out. So you can just pull your bobbin thread all of the way out and remove your needle thread cleanly and neatly. Leave the first row of gathering stitches in. That's going to help control the bulk. And if you have any successive operations that you want to do to this seam, like a seam finish, whether it be overcast or a bound finish, that first row of gathering stitches is going to help control that fluffy edge. If you pull it out, it's going to be more difficult to deal with. Okay. So, that finishes our lesson for today. We've done plain seams, open and closed, or busted and butterflied and closed. We have done self-finished seams with our French seam, our lapped seam, and we've done seam finishes with our bias bound and Hong Kong finish, our turned and stitched finish, and our pinked finished. And then we did our two eased seams. On our next lesson, we're going to move to more complex seams. We'll be doing curved seams and demonstrating clipping, trimming, grading, and understitching so that we can get our collars to look really nice. So thanks for your attention today, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>